Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasad Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. So my name is Chris Lindemeyer, and I'm a university professor at Rutgers University. Uh, retired. I have been involved with the Society for the History of Children and Youth since its founding and also worked uh, with the first editorial team to start Age Childhood. I guess and I'm Jim Martin. Um, I'm a professor <laughs> of history at Marquette University. Uh, I too have been uh, involved with the Society since its beginning as Secretary Treasurer. Uh, in fact, we're the only two Secretary Treasurers the Society have ever, has ever had, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and as president, and Chris is also a former president, what we're doing today uh, is part of a series of videos that uh, we decided would be uh, is an opportune time to do these because it's be the 20th anniversary of the society next summer uh, in 2021. Um, and so the Origins Project, as we're calling these videos, is an attempt to not create necessarily an archive of the history of society but more to create um, really oral histories of how some individuals uh, among the founders and uh, leaders uh, in later years of the organization um, see the sort of the legacy of the society. Uh, we're going to today, we, Chris and I will talk about these things, uh, but talk about why there was a, a need for this organization, uh, how the organization reflected or shaped the field, our personal connections uh, to the, the field as well as the society. Uh, and uh, so this is, in a way, the first of a series of, 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 of conversations uh, with people who were important to the beginning and the ongoing health of the society. And so we have a few questions. You'll notice us referring to questions from time to time. Uh, but it's really meant to be a conversation about our personal uh, perceptions and reflections on society. And so I'm going to get Chris started with our first question. Um, what was your connection to the field uh, and, uh, and to other historians of childhood before the organization was founded in, in 2001? Well, I think like most historians in this field, I did not co come to studying children because I was going to be a historian of childhood. I wrote a dissertation on the U.S. Children's Bureau, at least the first four decades of the U.S. Children's Bureau. And while I was doing that work, I increasingly saw myself wanting to know how the policies that in this case was, were largely devised by women in the U.S. federal government and also women supporters throughout the country, how these policies were actually reflected in children's lives and how it affected children's experiences. So by the time I had published that first book and had a job as an American historian, I was very interested in focusing more on children and youth and their experiences. But calling myself a historian of childhood was still not something that really raised to my consciousness until I'd say the late 1990s. And that's when I pulled a group of people together and we started the HNET uh, discussion group called H Childhood. So with Pat Ryan and Shirley Swain, uh, that's really, I think, when we defined the idea. I was also uh, in a lot of contact with uh, Joe Haas and Ray Heiner, who did see themselves as historians of childhood. And I think that that also helped to frame my professional image of the work that I did as well. Well, I, I also, oh, I came out of, of, a, out of left field, so to speak. I was, a, I am still <laughs> a civil war historian uh, and had had nothing to do with um, childhood studies at all. Uh, my first book was about Texas during the civil war. Um, 
And when that got published and I was on the way to getting tenure at Marquette, I was looking for a second book project. Uh, and my first idea was to do a social history of Sherman's March, um, famous event in the Civil War. But somewhere along the way, I came across a couple of books. One was David Nassau's um, Children of the City at Work and at Play. Uh, another was Elliot West, Growing Up with a Country, uh, Childhood in the Far Western Frontier. Uh, and I really liked them, and I assigned them to a class. I had a, a, a one-semester U.S. survey class that I taught to elementary ed majors who were required to take it. So it was entirely women for the first couple of times I did it, at least. Uh, and they, they read both books and wrote a paper comparing and contrasting these two kinds of childhoods at about the, roughly the same time period being covered. And they very much liked the, the books. We had great discussions about it. Um, I'm enough of a baby boomer to like talking about my childhood and my children's childhoods. Um, I think that's why a lot of us got, got into the field, actually. Um, and I, it's a superficial statement to make, but I think it's also true uh, about us. Um, and so as I developed this idea, very vague idea for a second book, I thought I'd have a chapter about children. Um, in it. And ultimately, and I don't quite, again, know all the steps, this is a long time ago, um, to this, but I decided to write a book about children during the Civil War, which came out in 1998. It was uh, very unique in that no one had written about children during the Civil War. Um, it was extremely interesting to me. Uh, it did pretty well as a book. Um, and so about the time that Chris and others were creating a childhood, I'm kind of getting into children's history. And I did a few other projects related to that Civil War era uh, children over the years and immediately following the publication of that book. And I would imagine it's a childhood that probably got me involved. And you came here for the for that conference, right? Because I got a big NEH grant to do a website called Children of America. Uh, and we had a conference that revolved around that just as we were getting mm -hmm. started. And I believe you were one of the plenary lecturers. And so right. that would have been in right. 99 or 2000, I think. That, that mm -hmm. conference would have taken place. So about not long before the, 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 the our, our next question, uh, the, the preliminary conference to the, the Pony Society. So that's my story, but I'm gonna ask you to talk about that 2000 conference uh, that you organized in, 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 in Washington. Uh, that conference really came together because Joe Haas and Ray Heiner had contacts with the Benton Foundation in Washington, D.C. And the Benton Foundation advocated on behalf of children with the federal government, um, particularly on issues that they felt were connected to commercialization, advertising, things that, that uh, the founder had been interested in. And Joe and Ray invited a few of us to get together to try to help the Benton Foundation figure out what they would like to do by knowing the history of childhood and the history of children's experiences uh, integrated into their work. So we were really very privileged to be able to be able to pull this group together early on to talk about the field in a way that I don't think any of us had had that experience before. So that was very lucky. Um, initially, there had even been some talk about trying to have a uh, Ken Burns <laughs> Civil War style documentary and interest PBS into doing something about that. So that's how large our thinking was. I mean, we were we were really looking to enhance the field. And with the support of the Benton Foundation, it looked like that was a possibility. Well, the Benton Foundation directions changed it a little bit. The person that we were working with there retired. But we still saw that having that conference in 2000, that there were many historians who did not identify themselves and also people in other fields, sociology and psychology, uh, education, who were doing the history of childhood, but did not identify themselves that way. They thought they saw themselves as historians of public policy, history of education, family history, um, commercialization, consumerism, whatever. And that pulling that conference together, everyone began to say, hey, yeah, that's what I do. I study children. I remember meeting you first 
at a national conference. It was the Organization of American Historians or the American Historical Association meeting and saying to you, so how did you get into looking at children? And you said, well, I'm a Civil War historian who all of a sudden got a new life and a fresh breath of fresh, yeah. you know, fresh look at my field. And I think that's what a lot of people got excited about was that here they had been defined in a kind of a traditional area and now they had a new perspective that brought new excitement to the areas that they were most interested in studying and teaching about. So that conference with the Benton Foundation, we invited 60 people um, who at that meeting- Was it an invite only? Those ideas. It was an invite only That's what I thought. Uh, meeting and uh, just two days. Uh, and that really, is where the idea of establishing a society that we had enough interest, enough foundation there that people wanted to be connected by the professional, professionalization, we should call it, I guess, of uh, having a society that would advocate. H childhood already existed, but that was more loose membership. A professional society could serve as a clearinghouse, an entry point, a advocacy group, uh, for people and also to help younger scholars get legitimacy for work that they were doing in this field. I mean, is that kind of your take on it as well, or did you have? Well, yeah, and I didn't know about the background stuff because I wasn't involved with creating the conference. Um, I remember being very excited about going to the conference. There's one or two other people I knew from my other life, as I say. Um, who were involved early on too, at least at the conference. What I remember, um, so apparently you must have said something to me about this possibility of creating an organization before mm -hmm. I got there. Because I actually talked to my chair before I left saying, you know, there might be this organization and I'd kind of be involved and with the department support, you know, mm -hmm. being the, 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 home, the home office. Now, as it, as it turned out, we were, did not require much support from the department because we were a very, low budget and uh, low key organization from a administrative standpoint um you you also did a lot of work yourself so oh, absolutely yeah yeah. That. yeah um but that we didn't have stationary for instance we didn't have i didn't have an ra I didn't need an ra you know for things so that they it, it, he was very supportive so i came in thinking that and i would like to be part of this um and we, we're 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 being pretty self-consciously historic here as we think about it and i Remember, even at the time, the meeting at the end of the conference, which is where the, we agreed to start an organization, which was a smaller part of the group. It wasn't all 60 people, mm -hmm. if I remember right. And almost everybody who became leaders later on were there. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking, this is really cool. You know, this is, this is, I'd found the field to be very fulfilling. I mean, I've, re, I've retained my Civil War field throughout the period since mm -hmm. then. Um, with a whole different set of friends and a whole different ways of doing things, you know, uh, but it was really interesting and fun to be on the ground floor of a new organization in my new field, you know, that I was kind of feeling my oats in a little bit. Uh, and so there's a lot of personal um, motivation as well as it's a good idea to have a, have this field represented, I think more formally. Um, I think one of the things we decided and that might have been another thing I'd cleared with my chair now that I think about it, it was to have the next conference in Mar at Marquette, or the first conference rather. I think we decided that that day at the meeting, or I volunteered it at least. Right. You volunteered um, it and then we moved on from that, right? Right, we decided to have summer conferences for, for, our, uh, for, the, for the society. Um, and so in, in the coming year, we you know, put together a regular conference. It was about 100 people, I think, maybe 90. Mm -hmm. We're at the first one. Um, we kind of set a precedent by having dorm rooms available. We wanted to make it a low mm -hmm. cost conference. And as Secretary Treasurer, throughout the time, I'm, I was the practical thing about practical stuff as much as policy things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was one of them. Uh, and so almost everybody did stay in the dorm, I think, that time. Um, mm -hmm. And to have them on college campuses to make it, again, cheaper. Uh, we had lots of grad students for that one. And I just, what was your sense of the conference? I have my own thoughts about what the conference was like, but what was your sense of arriving and being there and, and the tone? 
Well, I think it was just exciting. Uh, everyone felt that they were at the creation of something new. And that was very exciting for people. It could have also had a little bit of this issue of people who had done, say, African American history early on, or women's history early on, or even immigration, um, were, or ethnicity, were told, you know, this isn't real legitimate history. This, this is a fringe field. It's nice, you know, that you are interested in this area, but it, it's not as important as, you know, other more traditional fields like politics or great white men, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to be honest. Um, and I think people felt legitimized and really excited that they were talking to other people who were also interested in this topic and felt it had a real place in enhancing our perspective on the past. Um, there was also a lot of push to not just make it about the United States, that we really needed to be international. And I think we had a great advantage that H Childhood was always a virtual international discussion group from the beginning. So because of that, I think it helped uh, the people that were there to think in a more global perspective. Uh, that was my take on that first meeting. So it's excitement about the field, and also the fact that it, it should not be your, uh, just focused on the United States. Uh, yeah, I, uh, and I think it's, what's interesting is that the, the content of that first conference was overwhelmingly American. Yeah. But from the beginning, it, it was not meant to be an American-only field. Uh, it's been a thread in the society's history um, throughout. And it started mm -hmm. that very first meeting. But I, I have a couple of images of it. I, for some reason, remember, um, very clearly the first general meeting you know the, the of the membership because we had to approve bylaws and i don't mm -hmm. remember who all worked in the bylaws i think i came up with a very rough draft and other people joined in um i think we must have elected officers that day then too because we wouldn't have had officers before that mm -hmm. um and so i remember that that meeting which almost everybody stayed for I mean, it was a pretty i can picture the auditorium we were in um the biggest fight was about whether or not we had biannual or biennial. Uh, I was going for biannual. Apparently, it's not the same thing at all. But anyway, it was a very funny <laughs> argument we had um, before people could look it up on their phones um, back then. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I also remember Joe Hawes sitting to the side. He was running the meeting, if I remember right. Um, he looked pretty pleased with himself and with us. I don't mean that in a... Uh, mm -hmm. in a negative way at all he was he was so happy um seeing this happen you know and yeah i think there was excitement i think there was a bit of shyness because it wasn't that we all knew each other we had a little pot i knew like three people you know there personally mm -hmm. at least uh you probably knew more than anybody else did you know but they're just little pods of people that um knew each other and um it it wasn't as the first conference, it's not surprising, I guess. But I, I think one of the hallmarks of subsequent conferences is how extraordinarily noisy they are, uh, and friendly, <laughs> and and uh, um, full of friendships. That uh, oh, and, and this is actually an effect I've had. It's an effect it's had on me. Is that those kinds of friendships that you don't see someone for two years, but you meet them in two years, and it's like you were in their office last week, you know, chatting about stuff. And that was gone. Right. That wasn't there the first the first conference, but there was a real, very palpable. And I've never said that word before. A palpable sense of excitement. Um, I think because we're starting something new, and it really did seem to be something that reflected interests that we had that we shared very deeply. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I also think uh, you know by the time we had the next conference in two thousand three at the University of Maryland Baltimore County, and I took responsibility for that one. Uh, it was very clear that the people who were taking on leadership roles in this organization were willing to do the grunt work. <laughs> uh, Kathleen Jones did a newsletter that she put together um, just really by you know, contacting people and getting work out and making sure that that happened. I know that you worked with her on that 
as well. But she had the, uh, uh, we are co-editors for content, but she did all yeah. the work there. And it was she a nice all newsletter. The work. It was a nice newsletter. So we went from not only having the digital, we also had this newsletter that people could count on, kind of a precursor of the journal. And Kathleen really deserves a lot of credit for that because that, that was a lot of work. Um, the fact that when you and I both did the early conferences, uh, we set the model for you know being able to put an affordable conference on that people with little outside support could afford to come to because they stayed in dorms and all the work that, that right. went into making that happen. Um, transportation issues, I mean, just the little nitty gritty stuff. Uh, the editors on H Childhood w figured out a way that they weren't on 24 seven and did a rotating responsibility there. So the fact that people were willing to put the work in, I think is very, very much a lesson for if uh, other people are interested in professionalizing their field. It, it's not just about status. It's about doing the work. Yeah. And We should talk about why we kind of have touched on this, but one of our questions we set out was about why we thought, why the founders thought a society was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, what was it? And it might be almost as much in retrospect, here's why it was necessary as it turned out. Um, but there was certainly a, a sense of the, a need for a society. I, I, we, we are going to do one of these uh, origins project interview sessions with Joe Haas and Ray Heiner. And so I don't want to put words in their mouth, but my recollection of working with them early on is that Joe always felt like his work was something of an outsider and Ray as well. Ray worked more through the history of education side and Joe through the history of public policy side. But I think they felt within those fields, their work did not have the recognition from other historians that would help if you had a professional society that that was their main focus was to promote the history of children and the history of childhood. And that's where they were coming from. And certainly for the rest of us who were shifting from other fields, I, I think that at least for me, that's definitely what I thought too, is yeah. that we needed that. I'd been part of uh, the early editing team for H Women. Um, so women's history had been kind of through that uh, stage of development. I'd also worked with the Society for the History of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era early on. And all of those professional efforts, I think, raise the legitimacy of the fields in a way that if they hadn't organized professional societies, they wouldn't have been able to do that. And I think then that's what, it was just a thing to do as well. I mean, I'm not sure it is yeah. anymore. I mean, I think I hadn't thought about this till just now, in fact, but with the, yeah. in the with the internet um, and uh, well, and the different ways that universities support research now, especially the last few years, um, I'm not sure we would start a society now. That's not to say yeah. societies that exist now can't, you know, survive, but um, it's, you, you start a blog, you start, you know, you do something else probably yeah. um, to get what we want true. out of it. Um, mm -hmm. but, but then it was the thing to do. My memory is that Shigapi was actually one of the big models. It seemed to be a yeah. pretty well-run organization. Yet also a lot of people, I think the strongest period for our for this field is 1870s to 1920s and 30s. Um, and your work is certainly in there. Um, I've mm -hmm. done a little work in it, but that was kind of a lot where education reform happened, where other kinds of reforms going going on, where records become more plentiful, you know. So I think that the 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 excellence of that organization, but also the fact that a lot of people in our organization were actually in that one too, um, mm -hmm. made a difference. Um, I didn't have anything to compare it to. This is the only small organization that I belong to. The Civil War organization that I would end up becoming president of as well later on was much bigger in a way, but much less organized. It didn't do as much, it didn't have a conference then. Uh, so I had no other models, but I think Shigapi 
it was just fun to say for one thing, but also, um, <laughs> I think I might have stolen their bylaws. Uh, yeah, I, I think with. I brought them. Yeah, yeah I think with, so. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, br I brought them over, um, and I'd also been editing for H Gate, so you know the fact that I was already had that model as my experience. I, I think also was one thing that helped launch us a little bit more quickly than if we hadn't had something to build on already. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll never forget going to an early meeting with that society. And one of the reasons why uh, they said they needed to do more promotion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era was because there was no war in that period. <laughs> 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 so, you know, uh, I, I do think that sometimes, you know, you, that people who feel like their eras or their periods that they study are a little bit left behind because other things seem more sexy and exciting. <laughs> That's yeah. what draws some of us to professionalization. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, again, we, we kind of touched on this already, but I think I, I'll, I'll, again, I'll pose the question and we can both talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, I guess I'm going to twist a little bit. Have the goals of the society changed over time? How have we, what have we added to our goals? Because we talked about the internationalization of it. Um, we've talked about creating a place for people in, in the field to gather, so to speak. What other goals were there and what have we added to them over the 20 years that the society has existed? Well, uh, the internationalization has been the number one priority, but don't you think, and I'd be interested to hear what you think about this since you've mentored more students through PhD programs, but I think part of the society's goal also has been to make a pathway for younger scholars and graduate students who are interested in this field that they don't get that pushback that their work is fringe or not significant or that there won't be a job out there for them. Uh, one of the things that's in my experience is that before I even came to Rutgers University Camden, I had read the National Endowment for the Humanities um, proposal for starting a childhood studies department at Rutgers Camden. So that's how I became aware yeah. of Rutgers Camden and the interest there in childhood. So when I read that, I was very excited. It was after we had established the society, um, Chagape, so, the, or, I mean, not Chagape, I'm sorry, but the Society for the History of Children and Youth. So I was very excited to see that there was a university in the United States that also was interested in this topic because we knew that there were childhood studies departments overseas in Europe, particularly Bank Sandin's work in Sweden, but it hadn't really been something, you know, in the United States. So for me, part of the role of the society was to make sure that if childhood studies became important, history be was a part of that childhood studies growth. And, you know, that was something that I did not see happening in other history programs throughout the country or other even interdisciplinary efforts that involve psychology, sociology. They didn't really include history that much. Right. So I, I was interested in that happening. What, what's your take on it? Well, I think that's, it, it became a natural part of um, our thought process, I think, because so many at all the conference, so many people presenting were young, uh, either grad students or early career people. Um, and mm -hmm. so while I think our initial commitment to having kind of low cost conferences, and the costs have risen, but they're still relatively low cost considering, um, was because it was a second conference for most people. I mean, I, again, this is how I thought about it is that for most of us, you know, we, we have funding from our university to go to one conference and you have to kind of pick and choose other ones and having it in the summer. So it's out of the way of the big conferences and also on a campus where it's cheaper made it possible for people to go to that second conference uh, in, 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 the, in, in their year. But um, 
as it became obvious that the field was growing without us up to a point, um, <laughs> we made sure that grad students had access uh, to it throughout. And that ranges from banking at conferences, relatively inexpensive, to actually having, I don't think we did it the first year. I'm not sure we did it in Maryland when we came out to Baltimore, but certainly by the third year, the third conference also at Marquette, I think we were providing some kind of small fellowship, like maybe right. a couple of door, knives in the dorm, you know, for mm -hmm. grad students on the program. Um, and I think we continue to do that for the most part. I've not been involved with the mm -hmm. conference planning for a couple of times. Um, and it goes all the way up to um, fairly early on. I think the first change to our bylaws was to add a grad student to the executive committee, if I'm not mistaken. Right, exactly. Um, and so that's an extraordinarily, extraordinarily important thread, both just out of a sense of justice to the grad students, but also just for the society. The last time I remember having a hands-on part in the programming, and I can't remember which conference it was, it might have been even been Berkeley that far back, 30%, no, probably Vancouver, 30% of the program are grad students. And I think, and this is not uh, an unimportant thing, it's overwhelmingly women, you know? And so it's a, it's a, it's a organization that flips, you know, the demography. Uh, certainly of my civil work almost exactly flips the Civil <laughs> War conference uh, that we've come to have. And we actually, you know, I, I took some of the ideas about supporting grad students over to that organization, actually. Yeah. Uh, but, but the grad student thread is a really important one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that kind of gets to why, too, we eventually started the journal. Because the journal gave an outlet for publication as as the traditional markers for earning tenure and promotion continue to be the same it meant that if we were going to support these younger scholars as well as people who were mid-level who were trying to get um, full professorships there had to be an outlet for their work a professional peer-reviewed outlet for their work so the journal was a continuation of that idea as well and that journal started, of course, in 2008. And you can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, and I think my sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, I think Joe had that in mind from the beginning. My almost sense yeah. of Joe was that the purpose of society was to get a journal going. Because mm -hmm. that's kind of the traditional way that journals get started. Again, I'm not sure that's true anymore, uh, but it's it's... Yeah. Certainly for many years, that was, that was the case. Um, and I, I remember discussion with the journal started immediately. It was a matter of funding and getting a press. Mm -hmm. um, and making sure we had enough members to be able to support publication of a journal. Right, right. Um, and I'm pretty sure right now, well, pandemic aside even, it's harder to start a journal now than it would have been 20 years, mm -hmm. well, 15 years ago. Um, when it, when, it, when it got going, but luckily, and we'll have a separate interview with, with the founding editors, um, a group of people from the, uh, from Amherst uh, and other, other colleges uh, had friendly deans uh, and a lot of energy and, and they got it going. Uh, but that in fact was kind of a rough thing too. I remember there being a very, and I'm not really sure what the fight was about, but one of the few times that I remember being at a meeting at, at, at a society, um, at one of our society meetings, um, where tempers got a little, was about the journal. And I don't know why, I don't know what it was. You know, there's, there's something about it that was, was happening. Um, but for the most part, it's been a, a great success, I think. But I think having, having been a dean, I can say that any time that it's something that's worth something, that has real value to it, that that's where the, I don't call them fights, but the feuds, <laughs> yeah. uh, the controversies arise. And so the journal really was an important step. And I think that they, people were arguing about it only because they wanted to see it succeed. It was a really tangible version of creating the society. Yeah. I mean, the society has, you know, a one and a half page set of bylaws and, you know, we have, we meet every two years and what a journal is the, the, 
the record of that society in a certain way, I suppose. Um, exactly. And I think today, well, it's a, it's a great journal, you know, and there's still great articles. I don't know that, I mean, I was editor for a while as well. I don't think the numbers of submissions have fallen off as far as I know. Maybe just because mm -hmm. of the pandemic it has, but I don't know about in terms of the mm -hmm. field. Um, there are plenty of submissions, but I think there's yeah. a lot more being published in other journals now. Yeah. Because um, I don't know. I mean, we have the, the article award. is We have several article awards now in different languages and so forth. Um, and we don't have a rule against it not being one of our own, you know, publications, but it's not usually in our journal, this annual award that we give. And, and that says something about the field too. I don't think we'd start a journal now, you know, if yeah, exactly. we're starting from scratch, we wouldn't need to, we wouldn't feel the need to do it. Uh, probably. Exactly. Where, where do you think the future of all this is going? this field of the history of childhood or history of children, however uh, somebody contextualizes it? Well, it has, um, there'll always be a field. Um, whether or not you're gonna get more, we were talking this earlier, but but the, the notion of um, there being faculty lines for children's history. I don't think that's gonna happen. I mean, there'll be plenty of people who do children's history, but they're not going to be in a line that's been set aside for children's history for the most part. I think, I think we'll continue to operate as a mid-sized organization with a really, really good conference every two years, welcoming to grad students and to young scholars. But I think there will be, as there has been for the first 20 years, a lot of turnover. Uh, one of the things that, I mean, you faced it as such a treasure, I did it as well. Um, is that there's a lot of turnover in membership because people do come and go. Um, they, they, I mean, I, I, that could easily have been me. There's nothing saying I would have stayed doing children's history of which I get done with Civil War books. There's plenty of other Civil War books to write. Uh, but I decided to stay, I taught, created a class in children's history um, that I still teach at Marquette. Um, and I've had parallel careers there. And a lot of that first, the origins group, founders group, continue doing that as their main field. I think it's still a matter of many people coming in for one or two articles or for a book project or co-edited, you know, and, and that's, we're a, we're a welcoming organization. Um, and I don't think that's a threat. It drove us nuts sometimes because we kind of wanted to have, grow our membership. <laughs> but I think if we took, if there, I suppose there is a way of doing this, but I'm not gonna be the one to do it. Um, I would love to know how many different people have belonged to the organization over the 20 years. Um, we probably have less than 50 that have belonged all 20 years. I'm just guessing, I have no idea how many, but it can't be much more than that. Um, and I know well, about halfway through this period, I probably did do a little bit of research on continuity and it was well under a hundred people would, you know, would be a member for years at a time. So I think that will continue. Um, I think the fields that are represented at, at the meetings have ebbed and flowed a lot. Children in war was a very big deal for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, there'd be three or four sessions, you know, and that's, it was kind of where I'd be slotted in as a commentator or a chair or something like that. A lot less of that now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think fields will, will change and that will also mean more turnover of, you know, members. Um, I think, the international um, stature, not statute, characteristics of the organization will continue to be a bit of a challenge. It's always been a challenge um, for various reasons, I think, not out of will or um, um, commitment, more that I think in, in some ways at least European historians are more social science -y than American historians. Uh, of any field, not just American history. Mm -hmm. And so they don't always find our conferences very interesting. And, and the conferences are kind of different, you know, in Europe mm -hmm. than they are here. That's not a bad thing. It's just, I think it's a thing that is always gonna be a challenge every year. Um, I believe they were the ones, Europeans, and they have, again, different funding mechanisms and different situations for, they don't really get tenure quite often. It's a whole different process. 
are, we're less likely to be members long-term. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, these are, are not negative. There's challenges that I think will continue because uh, this is different ways of doing things a little bit. We've had great leadership from Europe. We've had great conferences in Europe. Um, and um, there are really more avenues, I think, in Europe, in journals, for instance, to publish. Mm -hmm. So we don't get a lot of submissions, at least not when I was in the journal, from Europe. We get some. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's still, I think, a, a work in progress that will probably never be done in terms of getting truly international. But we're pretty international, and it's something to be proud of, I think. Well, I, I would agree, and I'm very excited about the next conference next June in Galway, Ireland. Because of the pandemic, it will be a virtual conference. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity there because it's going to be a virtual conference. People who couldn't participate before because they didn't have the money to attend the conference face-to-face -face, uh, will now be able to be part of a conference in a virtual level. And, it, it could bring a lot more excitement. So I'm, I'm not disappointed about that. I think it offers the opportunity to be even more international and more available to a wide range of scholars than we have even been in the past. As much as we've uh, had a conference in England and in Australia and in Canada and in Sweden, this is again, another level of opportunity to expand the society's outreach. I agree. So on that happy note. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you. And I certainly look forward to seeing more of these as part of the origin project. Um, so we'll have some more insights from other people who've been such a part of growing this important field. Excellent. Thanks. <laughs>